Okay, then let's continue with the third talk of the session. And uh, it's titled uh, Information Theoretic Generalization Bounds for Learning Quantum Data. And we will have the pleasure to listen to Matthias Caro. The mic. Can people in the back hear me? Cool. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Matthias. I'm a postdoc at FU Berlin. And I'll be telling you about joint work with Tom Gur, Kambis Rosé, Daniel Stolk-Franke, and Satya Subramanian. Uh, sorry to say, this talk will not have Bohlen Bluff Hill inequalities. Um, it has other nice stuff, though. So, um, what I'm going to talk about today has the following background. And this is a significantly oversimplified cartoon of how I think about supervised machine learning. And first, I'm going to show you a purely classical picture. So the purely classical picture is that supervised machine learning is a two-phase process. The first phase is that of training. So in training, you feed labeled training data into your model. Then you train your model. This is some kind of optimization loop during which you update some parameters, typically via some gradient descent or something like this. And then afterwards, you've got a trained model with an optimized parameter setting. So think this is maybe um, a neural network where you now fix the weights, or it's some kind of support vector machine where you um, fix your hyperplane in feature space. Then comes phase two. Phase two is about figuring out how well you actually did in learning. So phase two is the testing phase where I'm giving you a new data point without showing you the label. But it is kind of similar to the first training point. So it's not one you've seen, but it's generated from the same data generating process. And now we feed that to the model that you trained. You predict the label, and I then compare that to the true label. And OK, if you learned well, then hopefully you got the right label. So if you think about this cartoon and where to make it quantum, there's different options. And essentially, you can make um, everything here quantum. So you can make the training data quantum, both the, the inputs and the labels. And you either can or even have to, depending on what part of the data you made quantum, change the model itself to be a quantum model and also the updating procedure might be a quantum procedure. But other than that, the idea should remain the same. So you still have some kind of training phase and then you have a testing phase. So this is a very naive perspective, but in this very naive perspective, there's um, a pretty important concept, which is the concept of a generalization bound. So in classical machine learning, generalization bounds are kind of the mathematical way of asking how well do you do on data that you haven't seen? So that means that we're asking, I have trained so that I achieve a good performance on my training data. And then I want to find out, do I also achieve good performance on testing data that I haven't seen yet? And the crucial thing here is that we want to bound the difference between test performance and training performance. This is typically called the generalization error. For the purposes of this talk, I'm always going to talk about the expected generalization error. So here we have an expectation value, and you should think of this expectation value as being over the training data that you saw. So I imagine that the training data is sampled from some random process, and I want you to achieve a good average generalization performance. In classical machine learning, there's loads of different ways of bounding this thing. And one that I find particularly beautiful uh, is a mutual information theory, uh, theoretic one. So here, you upper bound the generalization error by something that depends, whoa, wrong button, by something that depends on the training data size. So M is the number of samples that you saw. And the more you see, the better you bound. And it depends on the mutual information between the training data that you saw and the hypothesis or the parameters that you end up with. Okay. So the reason why I like this is because it has a nice, um, intuitive interpretation. So this means if the thing that you learn is hyper-specific to the training data set that you saw, it's probably not going to generalize well to stuff that you haven't seen yet. So what you want is you want to be able to learn something, but not about the specific training data set. So this is an intuition in classical machine learning. And what we were asking ourselves in this project uh, are two things. So the first question is, if we remember my cartoon, make some parts of the picture quantum, what does generalization even mean? And I'll A, try to convince you that it's not trivial, 
and B, I'll propose a definition of generalization in the quantum case. And then the next question is, can we bound the generalization error that you're making? And here, the natural idea is, well, we, we know what quantum counterparts of information theoretic quantities are. So can we prove bounds that are similar to what I just showed you classically and have quantum information theoretic quantities play the role of the mutual information that you just saw? So my plan for today is to first do a super short review of the classical framework, then tell you about the quantum framework that we propose and about the bounds that we prove. And then I'll just highlight some applications of our bounds. And in this section, I will then essentially uh, also hope for your support because we're still looking for more applications. OK, but first of all, what's the classical framework? So now I'll go a bit more into detail of what's behind this motivation that I showed you. So I will call these things true and empirical risk. People give them different names, like training error and testing error, but I prefer this one. So the scenario that I imagine is that your training data is a set of m iid random variables. So they're independent and identically distributed from some probability measure that describes the training data. And I'm going to denote the iid as like p to the m. You might also want to write this as like p to the tensor m or something. And you should think of each z as consisting of like an input and an output, right? So this would be like the input and the label. The next ingredient we need is a classical learning algorithm. And I'm going to think of learning algorithms that have some kind of randomization built. For example, this could be because your gradient descent is a stochastic gradient descent. Um, in principle, you could also describe deterministic learners this way. But for today, it makes more sense to think of uh, randomized learners. So if you do this, then a learning algorithm is described by a conditional probability distribution that tells you if you see a training data set S, what's the probability of outputting a hypothesis W? Notice that I'm implicitly assuming things are discretized here. This is not super crucial, but it makes many things easier. So I'm not thinking of a probability density. I'm really thinking of a probability distribution. And this then, together with the training data distribution, induces a joint probability distribution over the data and the hypothesis. And notice that this depends on the learner because this conditional distribution depends on the learner. OK, and then here, really, as I said, the thing to keep in mind is that your learning algorithm describes the conditional parameter distribution that you get from stochastic gradient descent. And then finally, we need a way of evaluating performance. This is typically done via so-called loss functions. So a loss function is a map that takes as input a hypothesis and a data point and assigns to it some usually positive value. So a large positive value is bad. Um, you want a small positive value. One of these standard examples would be um, to take your L of a hypothesis and a data point, again, data point being input and label, to be the difference between the hypothesis evaluated at that point and the true label and you square it. Of course, if you have like zero, one labels, this is either zero or one, so it, uh, you could write it in a different way. But if you have a continuous space, then you might want to write it like this. So this is the, um, the ingredients of the classical setup. And then we need two notions, namely these two ingredients that I had in the generalization error before. So we need the expected empirical risk, which you should think of as the expected average loss that your hypothesis incurs on your training data. Okay, So this is the data that you see during training. And you ask, how well are you doing on that? And then I'm taking an expectation value over both the data and the hypothesis. And the shorthand notation for this is something like this. I'm using R for risk, and the hat is for empirical. So this is the training performance. And the testing performance, I call it true risk. You get that by taking a new sample that you haven't seen. So it's independent from what you trained on. And you look at the average loss. And one thing that's an important insight, even though it's a very easy one, but still an important insight in classical learning theory, is that you can write this like an expected empirical risk with the subtle change that your distribution is no longer a joint distribution over data and hypothesis. But you work with independent copies of data and hypothesis. OK, so this means that your testing error, your expected testing error, has the same functional form as your expected training error, 
but you decouple the random variables that describe your data and your hypothesis. And then the expected generalization error that I showed you before is just the difference of those two things. Okay. And now um, let me quote this result that I like so much by Aulin Zhu and Maxim Raginsky, um, who proved that if your loss function is kind of nice, um, mathematically it should be sub Gaussian uh, for every fixed hypothesis, then they proved this generalization error upper bound that I showed you before in terms of a mutual information. Okay, so this is a classical mutual information. I'm not going to formally define it, but it tells you how much information. In this case, does the hypothesis W contain about the training data S that you saw during training? This is a really great result. At least I like it a lot. And what it essentially tells you is that if you think about the expected empirical risk and the expected true risk as being kind of the same thing, only difference being whether the training and the hypothesis are correlated or decoupled random variables, it tells you that decoupling these two random variables comes at a cost that is controlled in terms of a mutual information. So this is how I view this classical generalization. Okay, now I've been talking about classical stuff for a while. Probably I should start talking about quantum stuff. <clears throat> and here I first have to tell you how we, this, how we propose to model um, quantum learning. And our goal here is to describe a scenario where you're learning from data that is part classical and part quantum. So we do this as follows. We have a training data system, which has these classical parts Z, I, and then an associated quantum state. And what I mean by this is that you get this thing classically, but you only get a copy of the state, so not a classical description. And then you have multiple of these samples. But these states might be subsystems of some larger system. So they might be part of an entangled global system, which I view as the test system. And then you feed the training system into a learning algorithm. And a learning algorithm essentially will measure that thing, have some classical and quantum processing. And then they will end up with a classical hypothesis as before. But it could also retain a quantum system, so some quantum state that contains information that is then used for a prediction. And if you want to evaluate the performance of a learner, you have to keep around the test system and then perform some loss of measurement um, that combines the information from these hypotheses and the test system. So in fact, the picture I show here is what we think of as the empirical risk. Because here, the training and the test system are still correlated. In fact, they could be entangled um, because we modeled it like this. If you want to get a, a testing error or a true risk, you have to cut the correlation. right? So you have to cut the correlation um, between the quantum systems. And in fact, you also have to cut the correlation between the random variables. But it was too lazy to draw that here. So in a few more formulas, uh, our model is that the data is a classical quantum state. So it's some kind of average with a classical system describing a training data set tensorized with the corresponding state. This state lives in some data space. And then a quantum learner has some factorization of this data space into test and training data, can be described by some measurements performed on the training data space, followed by quantum channels that map the training space to a hypothesis space. And then if you look at what the learner does on the state, is it leads to, as before, as in the classical case, a joint distribution over classical data and classical hypothesis. But there's also a quantum system around. So it, it leads to a classical quantum output state, which is this uh, sigma A that, oh, I'm sorry, this is not the right expectation value. This should be an expectation value with the joint distribution, my mistake. Um, where now here the sigma A is a state that has both a hypothesis in it, but it also still carries the information from the test system because we haven't decoupled. Okay, and then if you now want to define risks in this way, we take inspiration from the classical case. So that means we, okay, we don't have loss functions with quantum, so we have loss observables, but we define the expected empirical risk as the expression where everything remains correlated. So the classical random variables are still correlated from some joint distribution. And also the quantum state that has a hypothesis and the test subsystem is still a potentially correlated or even entangled state. 
Whereas to get an expected true risk, we're cutting the correlations and we're cutting both. So we're cutting the classical correlation, meaning that we're dealing with independent copies of the random variables. And we're cutting the correlations in the quantum state. And in fact, we're doing a little bit more. So this is just a reduced density matrix of this state. This is not necessarily the reduced density matrix of this state. So this is the test system in the beginning of the procedure before the learner started messing it up. Uh, I don't have time to go into detail why we think this is the right definition, essentially because it reproduces uh, the right notions. But if you have these definitions of expected empirical and true risk, you can define a generalization error as the difference between the two. So um, let me emphasize again that the difference to the classical case is that now you have to decouple two things at the same time. So what we now have to do is we have to prove generalization bounds that show how these two decoupling procedures can be controlled in terms of information theoretic quantities. And what we prove is a quantum analog of the result by Zhu and Rabinsky. So what we show is that under a sub-Gaussianity assumption, which I'm not going to write down in detail, but it's like the quantum counterpart of the classical loss functions being sub-Gaussian, then we can up about the generalization error, this quantum generalization error that I just introduced, by the following beast. Um, so let's take this one at a time. There's an easy term, which we already know. So this is the classical term, which reappears here. It's a mutual information between classical random variables. The other two terms are genuinely quantum. So the first term here is a truly quantum mutual information, asking how much information is there between test and hypothesis system in these quantum states that we've got from the learner. And the second term has what's called a Holevo information. So this asks, uh, we have these kind of post-measurement states here, which, um, and we're asking how much information do these post-measurement states contain about the hypotheses? So this is roughly what the whole information measures. The proof sketch is, there's a powerful tool called um, Petz's characterization of relative entropy. It's a variational formula. And there is an inequality called Golden-Thompson inequality. If you combine both, you can lower bound um, a relative entropy in terms of this expression here that has what we think of as a true risk, uh, sorry, as a training error, and this log of the trace of a product state with an exponential. If you center the exponent and use what sub Gaussianity means, you can simplify this a little bit. And now you have a lower bound on the relative entropy that actually looks like a difference between a training risk and a true risk minus something else. Now you do some optimization and rearrange, and you're going to see that you get an upper bound um, that has a square root of a relative entropy in there. And if you know your entropies, you know that um, relative entropies will quite nicely lead to mutual information. It's not as straightforward because, as I said, this is not just the tensor product of the marginals. So then you have to work out what the expectations do. And there's a little bit of extra work um, that I'm going to skip for time reasons. So to highlight what we're doing is, now that we have both a classical and a quantum system, there's kind of two things that we could decouple. So we could decouple classically, and we could decouple quantumly. So this means that whereas before we just have a table with one row, we now have a table with four, um, four boxes. And we want to go, get from the upper left corner to the lower right corner. There's two ways of doing this, uh, but we decided to do this step. So we first quantumly decouple. And this is what leads in our proof to the quantum terms. So this gives us a quantum mutual information and a Huligo information. And then we do the classical decoupling that's already there in the classical literature that gives us the classical mutual information. And in fact, we um, you need these terms so you can show examples or reinterpret the classical case in different ways, showing that uh, the terms are in fact necessary. Okay, uh, as I promised, I'm gonna argue or at least claim that there are some applications of this, otherwise it wouldn't be much use. So um, without going into too much detail, let me say that the first application we have is based on these results, we can give an information theoretic tightening of 
um, the pretty good state tomography result that Aronson had in uh, his seminal 2007 paper. So what I mean by this is we can recover the result that Scott had, um, at least on average, but potentially, depending on your learning algorithm, our result is tighter because it depends on a mutual information. And to get Scott's result, you kind of brute force up a bound that mutual information. The second thing we can do is we can prove sample complexity bounds for learning measurements that you use for, say, state discrimination. And here again, we can prove bounds in terms of the complexity of these measurements. But you can also try to get at the more information theoretic quantity directly. OK, and then finally, um, we can prove generalization guarantees from quantum differential privacy. So differential privacy is kind of popular in classical machine learning and has recently received some attention in the quantum world. And what we can say is that an algorithm that enjoys privacy uh, will also generalize well. <clears throat> we have some more applications in our paper. Um, but in fact, I'd say that um, we're still missing a killer application. So we proposed this framework. And we showcase that this framework encapsulates some results and even proves some new results. So this first result is recovering something that already exists. The second result, I don't think, has been explicitly stated in the literature. Um, and the third result, to the best of my knowledge, is really new. But I think there's more room to apply this framework. So to conclude, um, the guiding questions for my talk were, what does generalization even mean if we allow classical and quantum data and hypothesis? And also, can quantum information theory help us bound a quantum generalization error? So I hope that my pictures at least gave you an idea of what I mean by generalization. And I hope that the theorem gave you an idea of how we answer question two. So we showed this kind of framework for generalizing in learning problems from CQ data. And while this already covers lots of things, it doesn't yet cover all learning problems that you might think of. So for example, it doesn't cover classical shadows or shadow tomography. And extending the framework to include those is uh, a, an open question from our work. Second, I showed you some quantum information theoretic generalization bounds. And here, there's been loads of classical improvements to these bounds. Um, and it's actually not obvious how to quantize them, because some of them rely on conditioning, for example. So I think this would also be interesting. And then finally, we gave several proof principle applications, some of them new. But I think there's lots of room for concrete or improved bounds under extra assumptions. All right, that's it. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any questions, go ahead. Indeed, are there any questions? Yes. Uh... A very simple one. So the classical bound. How, how are, what are the applications? Yeah. Exactly? So <clears throat> the main reason why classical people care about these information theoretic generalization bounds is because most of the bounds we had before just ask, how complex is the space of all possible um, models that you could end up with after training? And this is often overkill. So this leads to bounds that are in practice useless. Um, for example, bounds based on VC dimension. These information theoretic generalization bounds can be tighter. So for example, uh, people have used the information theoretic approach to explicitly study generalization behavior for uh, algorithms that trained based on stochastic gradient descent. Um, there are also uh, analyses that um, relate for um, relate training algorithms that regularize with information theoretic quantities to DIPS algorithms. So there's quite a lot of um, improvements of existing bounds, but even in the classical literature, I think they're somewhat lacking a killer application. So by now, they know how to reprove almost every generalization bound you can ask them about with information theoretic arguments. And they've got some numerical experiments um, highlighting that they are really better, but I think they're not yet the end of the story, is at least my current understanding of the classical literature. So even in the classical case, can I understand? <clears throat> Sorry. Is this is this bound is is this bound kind of relative in the sense that you know if I have two models and like one has like a low a smaller upper bound than other then I can somehow say that it's better in that sense is that correct or not because if that is the case then it's about to be really useful if it's not yeah. then mm. they're not tied upper bounds 
Yeah. So just because one bound is smaller than the other does not mean that that model is strictly better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for the question. So this is maybe something I didn't make clear enough. So when I say CQ for our models, I don't mean that you need a classical part. Uh, in fact, okay, this is going to take ages. Um, in fact, what I mean is that you can have a classical part, but this also applies for purely classical models. So whoops. if you look at this picture here, um, you could just throw out the ZIs and you would have purely quantum data, um, purely quantum processing, and if you want a classical or a quantum hypothesis. So for example, <clears throat> you can phrase average case versions of classical shadows or shadow tomography in our framework, and they would have only quantum data. It's just that our framework doesn't quite reproduce the strongest guarantees we have yet. So that's the weakness. But yeah, the, the goal was exactly to be able to say something about purely quantum data as well. Um, yeah, yeah, I think you can think about it both ways. So I'm saying the QQ is like a special case of ours because ours is like CQ to CQ and you can just throw away the Cs. But you're also right that in a sense, the QQ is a generalization of what we do. Great. Um, then let's take the rest of the discussion offline and we see each other in like three minutes. And let's thank uh, Matthias thank again. You.